Hello, book clubbers. Welcome back. So excited to see you. Hope you're dancing in your seat. Hope you're having a wonderful week. We're back. I'm Jeff Kanata. I'm here with Lana Bashinsky. Hi, Lana. Hello. Good morning. Uh, I'm, I know that it, we're already week two into this book, but I'm still just, man, I'm loving it. I'm got, I'm too. energized. I'm excited to be here and excited to talk about it. It's going to be really interesting to see how next week goes because I think we're making a hard right turn into completely new characters. I think <laughs> this was we're completing book one of novel four, House of Chains. Book one uh, is called I don't even remember. Um, <laughs> I don't remember either. <laughs> but uh, we we're doing chapters three and four of House of Chains this week, which completes the first sub book of the novel. And my understanding is we're moving on to new characters after this. So it'll be interesting to see how we, how we do uh, what it feels like next week. But I'm with you. I'm having a blast, having a great time. I hope uh, folks that are reading along with us are having a blast. We always like to start the show with a non-spoiler topic. And this week, the non-spoiler topic is inspired by spoilers. <laughs> so we'll... <laughs> We'll, we'll try to walk that fine line because uh, Lana and I were talking before we started recording this week that both of us were pretty surprised at the feedback we got from last week. Right, Lana? You, maybe you can summarize what your feelings are. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily the feedback that we got, but I love reading everybody's comments. I love seeing how uh, all of you are enjoying the, you know, it would being being a part of the book club and like the part that feels like we're all in this together, like how you feel about the story and the reactions of how many people were surprised that we enjoyed the first couple of chapters so much, surprised that we're enjoying this book, and how many people hated it was such yeah. a shock to we're me. Had because a, I, I think I had it. a hard time with some of the the internal monologue of of the main character in those chapters and. Without, you know, we're in non spoiler territory right now. So let's just say that, you know, there are some, there are some uh, ideas and thoughts and uh, goals and intentions uh, that are voiced by our POV character that, uh, you know, aren't, they're kind of repugnant, <laughs> you know, that aren't, that aren't uh, they're a little distasteful. And, and as a non spoiler topic, you suggested we kind of dig into that a little bit and talk about books more generally and that feeling of being along for the ride with somebody you don't necessarily like and really kind of aren't intended to like, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so how do you feel about the process of reading a story from a point of view of someone that you don't agree with morally, intellectually in, in any way. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, I, I mentioned it a little bit just through my praise of the, of the book last week. Um, but I find that I am, I think I said, I described it as being like kind of enamored with it where I, I am, I enjoy the experience because part of that experience is disliking the person. Part of that experience is disagreeing with the actions and and still seeing what's ahead you know the same way you watch a movie and then there's somebody who is a villain just because i am in the pov of this person uh i don't feel like i'm the villain because right. it's still all happening because of this person and and it is just the the story of what what they are and again that's not to say that this person's villainous but just as an example it, right. i i find i really enjoy that perspective because there are moments where you know it's very humanizing to see somebody that you disagree with acting in such a way and then do something that you're like well I agree with that and 
even finding points of commonality with somebody who overall I find their general demeanor. Oh, you know, we wouldn't hang out. Uh, I, I enjoy seeing sort of like where, you know, how, how much of a Venn diagram my personal tastes and the character's personal tastes are. Yeah. Uh, What about you? Yeah, no, I, I, there's also a visceral thrill of being able to be inside an experience I would never do, you know, like for, for movies or TV shows, you, you have stuff like Scarface or the Sopranos or, you know, these uh, Wolf of Wall Street, you know, these despicable characters, these people that are doing horrible things that if it was real life, I would want to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law, right? <laughs> yes. These are people that I want to be removed from society, uh, you know, um, breaking bad, you know, these things mm. where the the um, the quote unquote hero, the main character, the protagonist of the story is someone that I fundamentally do not align with on any level. And mm-hmm. yet in the context of fiction, it's compelling. I'm, I'm rooting for them. I want them to get out of the, oh, watch out, the cops are coming. I want them to, to figure out a way to get out of this one. You know, I'm I'm mm-hmm. hoping that nobody catches Tony Soprano. I'm hoping that he murders his rivals. And, you know, <laughs> I think that's that's the joy of fiction, right? You can, you can have that flight of fancy. You can escape into uh, circumstances that you would never want to be real. And I certainly had that experience uh, with this first sub book of House of Chains, I talked last week about how fun it was to just be with this guy who, yes, is doing horrible things, but is a badass. Like, is yeah. is incredibly cool and, um, you know, cool on a, you know, non-moral judgment way. Yeah. And I was very surprised how many people were like, oh, I couldn't enjoy it just because I disagreed so fundamentally with the morals of the character. Well, I I agree. I was surprised by it. But one of the things that I I found interesting and something I would love to hear sort of in the comments this week is, you know, obviously different mediums, TV versus um, or TV or film versus books, um, but still all, you know, uh, what's it called? Fiction. Um, people, do you think that people struggle to separate themselves from the characters in re- while reading because it feels so much more intimate. It's not something that sort of hits you. It's something that begins in an internal way because you like hear it in your head. I'd be interested to hear if people felt like more immersed and more like, even though it's saying the names of the characters and it's, it's, it is this third person perspective, no matter what that says, does it feel like I'm doing this? I yeah. I am being a part of these things I find reprehensible and therefore I have to distance myself from it. Well, yeah, I, I think you're onto something there. And, and I, I do believe that one of the reasons it may be more challenging for folks in the context of a novel than in something like say a movie or a TV show is because the experience of reading is intimate. Mm. It is, it is a personal connection you're making. You are, you know, even the most nuanced of films that uses, you know, voiceover to convey the thoughts of the character, you're never going to be inside the thoughts mm-hmm. of a character as much as you are reading your average book. Even a book that doesn't, uh, you know, d- doesn't use the techniques that Erickson does to really put you, I mean, literally uh, italicize thoughts of characters. But, e- you know, even any novel, I think any piece of written literature feels you're closer to the characters than you are in any given piece of film or TV. Cause you're, you know, you're distance, you're looking through this lens, you're looking at the characters from a third person perspective. There's no way to be inside a first person POV of a character in the context of film or television, but there that is immediate when you're reading. Mm. And so I think you, you're absolutely onto what may be the thing that is more off putting for some, that notion of, oh, I'm implicit in this. I'm complicit in this. Yes. You know, I am, I am, uh, I am participating because the thoughts are filtering through me. And I think that's fascinating, but it's certainly not something that prevents me from, from those visceral joys, you know? Yeah. Do you, I, 
Uh, yeah, those visceral joys and the overall broadening, I feel like, of my my understanding of other people. Like the, the one thing that's so beautiful about, you know, reading in general is, is like, like you said, like having these experiences that I would never have because that's just not the life I live and life I even want to live. Right. Um, but also these experiences I would never have because of who I am, where I was born, what my life has been. Right. Um, yeah. And so for, you know, for better or for worse, there's so much I can gain. And I just, I just love it. I love it. I do too. And, you know, now to sort of creep into a little bit more spoilery tech territory, not super spoilery, but at mm -hmm. least um, I want to reference specific things that happened in those first two chapters we talked about yesterday. Um, so if you haven't read anything, maybe this is the point where you, you stop. But, um, you know, I noticed uh, Mr. Erickson's comment on our uh, YouTube video spoke to something that I thought was. I thought was pretty obvious and I, and I kind of wish I had made a more, um, a more, a more of a point to, to bring up because I think for me, it was just sort of a priori. Like I, I just assumed that we all were on the same page of mm -hmm. the fact that the author wasn't advocating for this. <laughs> yes. Right. And Mr. Erickson says, um, uh, book one of House of Chains, ironically, is itself a compressed novel. Two parallel narratives are at work in those first four chapters. The surface narr narrative belongs to Carse's POV, and it's dri driven, <laughs> narrow, even truncated POV, limited by his ego and his worldview with all of the blind spots that entails. The other narrative comes via other characters, especially Bayroth. Thank you for the pronunciation. Thank you. <laughs> um, whose commentary sends a direct but alternate message to the reader. In a sense, telling the reader to suspect Carse's POV, as they should. This provides an out from what could have been an oppressive and profoundly unlikable main POV. It also signposts that I, as the writer am not all in on Carse's way of seeing the world and that accordingly the overall narrative has a lesson to deliver to Carsa. Mm. I, I, I totally grokked that in reading it. Like that just, it felt uh, completely clear to me that especially, and especially, you know, last week I talked how much I love Bayroth mm -hmm. and he is constantly poking holes in Carsa's, um, worldview arguments yes, opinions yes. And, and, and as he a makes reader, more sense he's like hey i don't know maybe we should be nice to people and like maybe you should look <laughs> and that quote that i read last week that was one of my favorite quotes of of, of that uh those two chapters was bayroth being like what i actually wish for you is that you're not so certain about everything and yeah. i feel like oh that is completely clear to me that both the author and the context of the narrative suggest that hey carsa has got a lot to learn here. Just because we're inside his POV doesn't mean he's the the, the guy, the beacon. Yes, the moral uh, compass. Yes, and like especially like the joy I feel as a reader when he gets roasted by other people. I feel like that in in and of itself is such a special moment and such an indicator. Um, the you know, yeah, just I. I don't know how much more to say before we're getting into spoiler territory, yeah. but it's, yeah. uh, I, I, for f folks who, who have struggled with, uh, being inside this, this, this POV, like being inside the, the, the mind of somebody who's like default state is, I think of it as like a mindless frabro kind of violence, um, looking for those other characters, like perhaps this is something that would make it more palatable to you and, and maybe even change your perspective or enjoyment of the story. So I'd, I'd be super yeah. curious if anybody takes a reread, sort of knowing those pieces and looking for those touch touch points. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's certainly I, a valid I want them thing. To feel I want mean, the joy I feel. I'm not trying to like remove right. that, that away from anybody. I just want to gift you the yeah. hype that yeah. I have. Not, exactly. We're not saying you're wrong. We're just saying it's more fun this way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into it now because we're going to talk uh, chapters three and four of House of Change. So spoilers starting now. And honestly, the first thing I'll say is like one of the things that I loved most about these two chapters is that Karsa has some revelations. Yeah. Like he realizes some stuff. There's moments where he's like, 
oh, maybe I shouldn't have been such an a-hole to everybody. You know? Oh, like, I remember in the past, I would have just slit this guy's throat. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe yeah. talking isn't that bad. He, he literally has this beautiful uh, 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 sequence, this, this uh, section where he realizes, oh, I haven't had, there's been no subtlety. I, I have I realized that subtlety was something I just didn't get at all. Maybe I should uh, rethink some things. So I, I it's clear and to me that he changes, you know? It's clear that he changes. And like the idea of subtlety, because uh, unless I was mis- misreading it, you know, Torvald has, he's quippy and he has yeah. like subtlety yeah. and like the things he says, there are like jokes, like lightly interwoven in, in everything he says. And uh, Carsa, I think feels it more than actually parses it in the moment. He's like, something's happening to me in my yeah. brain while we speak. And I don't know what it is, but I don't not like it. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. And he's, he's sort of, he gets it. He sort of gets it over time. And I, I think that's cool. I mean, really see him change. And one of the reasons he changes is because he suffers. And uh, we start with uh, the first scene of chapter three, uh, things are bad for Carsa. He, mm. He's been captured by the Malazans. Uh, Silgar, uh, the slave master, is also captured, as is Damisk. Uh, and they are all uh, on this wagon. Uh, Carsa has been tied down, chained down to this board. Uh, and he stays there for a while. <laughs> uh, just a few, a, a few short weeks into months. <laughs> yeah, just a few short, terrible, torturous <laughs> uh, weeks. Yeah. Um, so he's on the wagon bed. He's being eaten by bugs, and vermin are crawling all over him. Uh, he's uh, being starved. He can't eat. He's hot. He can't he move. He to defecate on himself. Like he doesn't have options. That's it. He's strapped to this thing. Just awful, mm. awful, awful. Torvald's talking to him, uh, keeping him sane. Uh, and then at one point he mouths off to the, uh, to one of the, the, uh, soldiers and they smack him with a, with a shovel. They got just, Malaz got shovels. They folks got, got shovels. Folk, folks got shovels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I do like the fact that they, <clears throat> he sort of, he doesn't really convince them. That they convince themselves that he's a secret claw that's there to spy uh, Tor- on him. Torvald them. is. Yeah. 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 Torvald. Oh, and yeah. Torvald, the way that he brings it about is so, I, I'm just so happy to have another little quippy character in there. Yeah. I just, I love, uh, especially because like the sass hits. <laughs> like I've read books where like a sassy character is written and they're, they're you're told that they're sassy because the author says this person was so sassy and then they right. say like the lamest things. No, these characters are, are they have their it's it's built in. It feels great to read. It feels delicious. And him being like, perhaps this is part of my reporting. The Empress <laughs> yeah, will be interested yeah. to hear about this. And the guy's like. <laughs> it's it's so awesome though that he he doesn't like have this brilliant plan to pretend to be a claw. They're like, well, you, unless you're a claw, and he's like, maybe I am. <laughs> you know? I have never said that I'm not one. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it's so good. It's so good. And they're like, <laughs> anyway, was, I thought that was very funny and fun. Um, but yeah, uh, Carson gets smacked real hard with a shovel, uh, passes out, and when he comes to he comes up with a plan that he's going to, you know, having learned from his uh, his buddy Adelum Thord, who mm-hmm. you know we know had a brain damage and was, uh, you know, uh, reduced to being more like a a, a pet. Uh, he he's going to feign uh, that kind of brain damage and uh, pretend to be incapacitated and less of a threat to the Malazans. I loved how quickly that came about from Dellum's experience um, uh, getting his head bonked and going through his whole like lifespan and in, into like his tragic ending in the street. Yeah. And how quickly that, you know, we see that, that thing that was so tragic be like a, a small thread of hope for seeing somebody get out of a terrible situation, like seeing him be able to turn that and like this tactical 
guy knowing that he's looking for any advantage being able to take a sad experience and turn it into a like a a, a lifeline i just i loved how quickly that that came about it was it was lovely i agree but i also love that it wasn't this magic salve right yes. he's he he's good, he says i'm going to pretend to be you know addled addled and it's still awful right yeah. he almost becomes actually addled because yeah. it is still so grueling and awful and yes he doesn't talk to anybody yes he pretends to be out of it but it's still so grueling so torturous you know it, it's it's not like oh well, he's you know, he's founded this brilliant so plan like, and so it makes oh, everything easy. So they were like, oh, he's fine. Set him free. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. It, it, it was an awesome – I mean, you really get a sense of the suffering that he goes through strapped to that board. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very funny to me also that the name of the Malazan captain is Captain Kindly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I also love that the – you know, him sort of being in this state and – it forces – I mean, he's obviously very much into thinking versus talking. That's very clear through the whole course of this first book. But him ha like having to sort of play this role to try and give himself a, a future opportunity, I feel like it almost forces him to be more introspective in a different way because it causes yeah. him to be default to being nice to Torvald. Yeah. Through, through the absence of like, you know, be, being – like uh, not in the right mind of any place to be be cruel to him, but I think he would be cold and distant. And because he was playing this part, he sort of let Torvald in because he had to be taken care of in the state. Right, and I think it yeah. sort of is the 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 first bridge to forming the relationship that they do. There's that wonderful moment <clears throat> when. Uh... Torvald, is, he's like, I'm gonna, you know, I'll, I'll probably kill, I'll probably kill you when I get the chance. And and Torvald's like, well, what are the reasons why you'd kill me? And he's like, well, you know, here's all the different things you could do. He's like, talking too much is that one of them? He's like, yeah, 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 probably, probably. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very funny. And then of course, the talking too much is is the thing that keeps him sane, right? The fact that Torvald c constantly is talking to him and and keeping him up to date. He learns the Malazan language. He it's it's beautiful that this thing that is this source of consternation through the beginning of their relationship becomes the thing that he grasps onto yes and keeps him sane yeah yeah um okay so they uh they move from wagon to boat but he is not moved he's they literally just pick up the board that he's on Take stick the it on the off. boat yeah yeah hoist it vertically so he's Ugh. you know almost like crucified on this thing um Really powerful stuff. Just I, I was so in the suffering that that he was experiencing. You know the the transportation, the time, the the staying in one place. That the, the way his body is is withering away. You know he's he's not eating. He and, you know, the few times where they like put something in his mouth and it burns and he, he throws up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and even just like that moment of being horizontal on the cart bed for how many weeks to being hoisted vertically and suddenly all of his weight is pulling on the chains and the pain, like the excruciating pain of just shifting positions. Ugh, I just, I felt it. I felt it in my own bones. Totally. Yeah. Um, then we have, um, you know, there, there are these moments where he's, you know, communing with his God and kind of having this crisis of faith almost. Mm -hmm. Um, where he's, you know, what, what do you even want from me? And, and Urugal, his, his God, uh, is kind of chastising him for being weak and, and allowing himself to be taken and not being a warrior and not destroying everybody. I thought that was interesting stuff too. I thought it was interesting, like mostly because I feel like Karsa would have been like, you're right. Yeah. Like weeks before that. Like yeah. the first time he got captured being like, oh, oh gosh, I'm weak. I'm not, I shouldn't be chosen by Urigal for whatever. Uh, the fact that he's like, you're weak, you got captured. And he's like, he's kind of like, hey, man, I don't think that's true. I'm like, I have a plan here. I got <laughs> captured, but like, just you wait and see, kind of. I'm doing my best, Urigal. 
buddy. Come on. Hey, hey, guy. I thought we had. I thought this was like a. We were cool. You're not. This is not cool. And I think there there is a moment where Urgal says that the gods, the the faces of the seven or the seven faces in the rock, uh, must choose another. And it mm-hmm. reminded me of when um, when they released a uh, calm the the fork fork. Fork girl sale. Yeah, uh, she said he's destined to do great things, but if he doesn't, another one will be chosen. Yeah, and I wonder if he already like missed his shot. You know, I didn't get the impression that he missed his shot. I got the impression that they were the you know these these seven faces in the rock. The voice that that sort of speaks to him in these dazed moments was like, it looks like you might be like just dead and captured, guys. So we gotta. Find somebody else, and he's like, "No, no, 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 yeah. no, no, no! I got this. Just wait." And then he like wakes up again, and they're like, "Okay, you're not dead yet." Well, the crazy thing is, right then, like he's having this crisis of faith. He's communing with Uragal, and then the sky opens up, and chains shoot down and murder everybody on the ship and destroy the ship. So it's like, was that Uragal intervening and and helping him out? Was that something else? Was that just the Warren that they're entering into? Yes. What did you make of that? Uh, well, first of all, I, I think we should talk a little bit more uh, just because the transition between um, being in Karsa's head and, and Karsa's sort of vision that he's having of this place and being on the pile of bones and being attached right. to the many chains. I think like much like the last book, anytime there was like it's memories of ice, what does that mean? It's literally that there's ice it used to be ice magic. Oh, memories of ice. It used to be the Jacob people, memories of ice, and like right. all the different places. This is the first time where I'm like very explicit. Well, House other of than chains. that, chains, but like <laughs> chains, chains, there's chains. It's <laughs> yeah. like what my brain was doing. Um, but that visual going from him and like all the chains being taught around him, but at the end of every single one was, I mean, my perspective was, oh, these are all the people that he has killed in the past or had like some kind of hand in slaughter, thousands of them that he slaughtered and like getting their sort of revenge moment. And then transitioning to him being conscious, Torvald being like, you've been, you've been out for weeks, man, you got to get up, you got to stop this thing. And he's like, I don't know what that is, but describing it as chains from the sky. I was like, chains from the sky, what? And then it was chains of lightning. Right? Right. I think so. I think so. I think the metaphor is supposed to be, um, you know, I I think I did not visualize it as regular old lightning. Do you know what I mean? Like it's dark, the sky is pewter. It's, you know, obviously they're going into this Warren, but I felt like it was, it was directed intentional lightning that felt more than just a lightning storm, right? I felt like the way that this was written, truly the picture of it in my head, I felt almost like like I was seeing through like Carson's own days. So he wakes up and he's like, look, there's this thing, look at the sky, there's chains hitting. And in my brain, the impact of the boat splitting apart, I pictured like massive chain links like whipping and rending it apart. And only when he got far enough away, he's like, oh, it's lightning. They're chains of lightning. And it was like right. a clarity. And it's like the vision of, of what I pictured in my own brain sort of shifted yes. at that moment. And it yeah, was- it's like his delirium is, is, it was kind of communicate. We were witnessing it through through his, that transition state between this, you know, dream world and the real world. Yeah, I totally agree. I, yes. I can't believe how effective that felt to me from the idea yeah. of like, chains are whipping down to- chains of lightning are striking down at this place but no yeah. matter what i agree i definitely did not picture normal lightning going yeah. through this scenario but i d- i didn't know how to read it i just because of information we get later down the line my brain says oh uh i do think that is some kind of intervention i don't think it's something that he called from within himself but that's because of what we learn a little bit later from about the blood oil and where he comes from yes uh, just quick note, there's some work being done on my house, so I hope you're not hearing it. I'm trying to ride my mute button, but apologies if you're hearing some ancillary noise in the background. It's louder than I was hoping. Anyway. Yeah, I ca- um, can't hear anything from what it's Oh, worth. good. Okay. Well, you probably will at some point. <laughs> okay. Uh, I love the the next scene where he wakes up floating, still chained to the 
to the wagon bed. Mm-hmm. Um, but Torvald has been doing work, like putting stuff underneath it, making sure he's floating, like mm-hmm. collecting stuff, swimming out, collecting the flotsam, you know, picking up the useful bits and making his little, his little carsa raft. <laughs> I, it, the, the, seeing these, these scenes through just like when Carsa is waking up or not and Torvald, I'm like, this is like those, those birds that sit on an alligator's head and like <laughs> yeah. clean its teeth kind of like taking yeah. care of it. It just feels like a little, a little friend just doing things. It's like very, totally. very sweet. And also like waking up and he's just kind of like, there's no food. There's only a little <laughs> bit of water. Ah, who knows what's happening? We don't know where we are. This is not earth. <laughs> like, yeah. Things are bad. You're sinking. Nothing I could do about it. I've been trying really hard. You're still, you're just too big, bro. I don't know what to do. And, and like, how long are these lapses in his unconsciousness? Like, I know one time he wakes up, he's like, it's been weeks, bro. And then yeah. he like days between these moments of consciousness for Carsa and Torvald still just scurrying around doing everything he can. And obviously being like alone, being like, where am I? What's <laughs> happening? Oh, uh, yeah. Can you imagine? I mean, from his perspective, like, you know, <laughs> like, this oh, dude, he doesn't God. know if he's even going to wake up. He's enormous. He's sinking. He's cl- clinging to this piece of wood. He's in. There's no sun. There's no day. There's no night. He's there's just no like, oh. oh, gosh. So it's so good. It's like such a yeah. great dynamic between these two. I know. I love I love their little burgeoning friendship, too. Mm-hmm. It's it's so beautiful. You know, we get later on, we get uh, Carso being like, you're my friend. I will call you warrior. Not Tebnor yeah, you warrior. are, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like, uh, warrior nonetheless. Very cute. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, they uh, they are in a strange, strange place that doesn't seem to be uh, the na- main world we're in. And they eventually come upon this, the remnants of this huge naval battle with all these ships, strange looking, black hulled ships, uh, with body, bloated bodies in the water everywhere. Well, I uh, love that they had like these black hulled ships, but then like the details of like the battle that they had and the sorcery, some of them were actually like a red cedar and you knew it was paint. Like it just shows that the, like the two like types of people that were fighting and like where they came from, like, geographically because of the wood that they used or whatever. Uh, I just thought those were interesting details that really painted oh, yeah. an interesting picture. And the the, the moment where uh, Torvald realizes like, oh, it's shallow. <laughs> it's like, we're yeah. going to drown, we're going to Oh, I could stand up right here. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but the, you know, the bodies are like you know, bobbing around. It's just, just seems so horrible, this situation that they're in. And then the giant catfish show up well, and start eating the bodies. My impression of it is that like the bodies weren't really bobbing around. He like hops in the water. Then he's like, oh, it's shallow here. But it is corpses. I'm standing on corpses. Like they were so yeah. bloated and so waterlogged that it's not like they're still floating. They've been, they've soaked in all the water and sunk to the bottom. Yeah. And so not and then he imperceptible them. corpses. Yeah. And then then suddenly that they're there. Yeah. And, and, and the that funny realization that Carsa has where he's like, I this would come up to my shins and I'm still gonna drown in it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> I'm gonna die in the most pathetic way possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, but before that, I mean, before even the catfish uh, attack, it um Torvald finds some shipwright tools breaks Carsa from his chains, but his muscles are so atrophied, his body is so broken down that he can barely even, you know, Bend do anything. His own arm. Like yeah. any any movement is excruciating. Then the catfish attack. <laughs> uh, these enormous catfish that are after the uh the bloated corpses and are eating them whole. Um and they run and and uh they uh, climb up the deck of the ship. Uh, right as the catfish are trying to swallow Carsa. Then we get on to, <clears throat> oh, Torvald harpoons one of the catfish, <laughs> which is like, I got it. And then it's like, ah, it's pulling us. <laughs> the whole boat. And Carsa being like, could you not have speared just a smaller one, man? So, so rad. I mean, the this entire adventure that they go on of being captured, breaking out, being captured again, 
breaking out, finding the, the like the 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 just the progression of the adventure that they're on. You know the the moment to moment out of the frying pan into the fire mm-hmm. element of it is so much fun. I had so much fun with these chapters. These four chapters, so much fun. So much fun, and especially because sort of the. Uh... It's like the the real cartoon villain of this of these first this first book, who I think is Silgar, good old Cufflink. Um, yeah. <laughs> I feel like he and like him constantly popping up and being like, "This guy again, come oh, on!" It's, it's so great. Where they like <laughs> they help him and he still screws them over. You know, it's so it's so uh, what fun. A chump. So yeah, exactly. What a jerk. <laughs> um. Anyway, so uh, they they find the bloodwood sword. Uh, the catfish is is pulling them. Uh, Carsa uh, gets into this fight with the catfish, falls into the into the below decks, stabs it, and the like a whole corpse falls out that it hadn't even digested yet. Uh, Just awesome imagery. Well he, well, he stabs it, gets thwapped against the wall, gets yeah. knocked unconscious for the you know umpteenth time. Yeah. And when he wakes up, the catfish is hanging, the corpse is slapped out of the body, and it's just the most dis- like the most rotted, disgusting. I just is uh, I I it's so good. It's so, so good. good. I don't have so I don't know good. anything else to say other than yeah. it's so good. The, the, <laughs> those wonderful uh, illustrative images. You know the the image of waking up and seeing this sliced open catfish with his corpse. Oh, I, Yo, it will stay with me. You know, it's you know beautiful. that game before your eyes or whatever, where you, every time you blink, a scene changes. Oh yeah, yeah. I feel like oh I yeah, need the video a mod. game. Yes. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I need a mod of that. Yeah. It, it's like every scene <laughs> is like what Carsa is seeing. <laughs> totally. Totally. Um, all right. So then they uh they they get to a, another ship. Uh they climb uh, oh, a, a a rope ladder f- comes down. So there's people on this ship. Uh they climb up to it not knowing what they're gonna see. Uh they encounter uh, 16 gray-skinned warriors standing on the deck. And Kars is like, I like them odds. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yeah, but you're like more feeble than ever. And he's like, yeah, that's why it's a fair fight. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Watch me slaughter. Uh, and we pretty quickly realize he's creating the scene that we come upon or came upon in novel two dead house gates when <laughs> felicin and bowden and all our bros uh, uh find or f- find themselves in the same warren find that same ship the uh what is it Sol- 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 solanda solanda solinda I, I don't remember the name of the ship uh what's it called i'm gonna find <sighs> it i wrote it down um Sol- uh, solanda yeah the solanda yeah. So, uh, so what they found when, when, you know, when we were talking about, oh, there's this dude with a harpoon through his chest sitting in the thing and there's all these beheaded heads and there's, you know, what, what happened here? There's this massive fight. It was Carsa. Ah, yeah. So good. Him getting up on that boat and then being like, all those heads just looked at me. I was like, yeah, baby, we in it. Let's go. I know them heads. I know them heads. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So good. And see, uh, it's so delightful like walking and like the whole time i'm reading this whole book i'm i am looking for those context clues of like when am i okay i've got some ideas of like where am i but when am i i think it's on the cart or maybe it's during like one of the boat transfers that they reveal or maybe it's not yet but they reveal that oh oh the malazans blah 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 everybody's like oh they don't want us to take over we don't want <laughs> everything to calm down and people stop executing each other and trade to be pretty good makes us want to rebel. He's like kind of making fun of how people rebel against the Malazans and saying like, Oh no. Cause it must be on the cart because Carsa says, as soon as I'm free of here, I'm going to Darugistan and I'm taking over. And he's yeah. like, you're too late, baby. The, yeah. the Malazans are there already. Yeah. Uh, and he said, they just took over pale and I think they're on their way. Yeah. And so, we know that this is roughly the same timeline as Gardens of the Moon. Right. And so it's exciting to place this this boat thing with everybody. I mean, most of the, many of the people on the boat still alive. 
in the timeline of when that happened versus when we experienced it the first time around. It's just, it's, it's yeah, so totally cool. So satisfying seeing like knowing how they came upon the boat and what they saw and what, they, how they were trying to piece together, like what happened here. And mm -hmm. when he catches the harpoon, I was like, I know where that harpoon's going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, where uh, you at captain? And, yeah. And it's so rad how he harpoons the sorcerer in the chair as the sorcerer is opening a Warren. And so the Warren like stays open cause he dies. And so that's part of the reason that Felicin and everybody is actually kind of saved is because there's this ongoing magic that's open there. I just thought that was also rad. Yeah. So uh, rad. Teed it up. Uh, teed I also, it up. I also like that they sort of joined this boat and you know, when Felicin and crew are on the boat, you're like, oh yeah, the people running the ship were nasty, nasty folks. They were mean meanies, not good. Yeah. And then Carson goes in the boat and they're like, kneel to us. And it's like, yeah, they villains. And then they're just dead. <laughs> we don't learn almost anything more about them. There's not like a, ooh, what is the plot? What is actually Yeah, yeah, here? yeah. They're like, no, you bad. And I know <laughs> that you don't know who I am because you got with an arm's length, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's so good. Great. So good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> amazing. Um, Carson O'Neill. Uh, but then this is the this is the moment where he kind of realizes, hey, um, subtlety is not something I've uh, noticed in my life, and maybe I need to uh, maybe I need to work on that. And I probably would have killed Torvald uh, earlier, but now I kind of like this guy. And hey, maybe I shouldn't just murder everyone I encounter. Yeah, Tor yeah, Torvald like uh, da -na -na -na. <laughs> <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> <laughs> Torvald like trash talks him a little or, like sasses him because yeah. he kills everybody on the ship yeah. and he's like yeah I would have just killed him for that too and that idea that it's so funny to have him like literally like cleaning his blade after killing people he's never met never understood for two <laughs> seconds yeah um, being like a subtlety what a concept but immediately being like oh yeah Bayroth was always being like this he was always being like Torvald and try to even just like think back through anything Bay Roth said and what that actually, what meant or what was at the heart of that. It just bounced off of me. He has no idea this, that, that time is lost. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good stuff. Uh, and then we have this little quick moment where uh, the mud transforms into seven figures. And I, th I think these are the same Logros Talan Imas that show up and That help. is not my impression. Okay. I'm probably wrong. What? Okay. My impression, I don't know, but the the description of them was a little bit grosser. Mm. They like they had I think more I can't like remember exactly the details now, but correct me if I'm wrong. My my brain says it was like uh some Talon that we haven't met that were more of the seafaring Talon. There was like the the bar well, guest well, they there's they the, are like descendants of Talanamas, right? And then the there's the Tisti Idur that we kind of the Tisti Idur are the heads, right? Isn't the Tisti Idur the heads and the Tisti ND? Uh, who is the who are the people running the boat? I thought they were the Tisti Idur. The Tisti Idur were the people running the boat. Yes, that's correct. And then the heads were Tisti ND. Correct. And, and then, then the Talanamas, the Logros Talanamas. The bone casters are the ones that showed up and gave Stormy the sword. Yes, the, that, the flint that was, sword. Yes, and that was that in the in book two. Yes, and these folks that popped up. Oh Not no no, them. no no no! I am getting confused. The people that pop up, I thought they were like the seven faces. Because they pop up uh, and they're like, Ugh, he's not doing what he wants us to do. That was yeah, the scene. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right. The reason that I thought it was the same people is are, don't the bone casters show up in book two be, out of the mud? Like, don't they like for, come but, up out but of the they, mud? But the, see, the difference was that these ones are described as like goopy. They come like out of the mm. mud and they're like, they, they, All right. it, there's like a wetness to it. And the bone casters, it's always like theirs is dust was traveling across the the surface of the water and then they came out of the dust it's always coming out of the dust out of the earth and right these were like because they of the gooped up onto the ship and right. there's like a nastiness to them but they did it did have like swords and stuff in them didn't it in the scene 
I might have been yeah. confusing it with another one. Yeah, they talk about the, you know they they're they're kind of talking riddles a little bit, uh, or not, at least. But they me. are talking <laughs> about they are talking about Carsa, and they're like, yeah, Ugh, this guy is not doing what we want him to do. That's true. Um, and then ignore everything I said about like the line- lineages. I forget. I have to go back and like say I know there was like a whole chapter in the last book where they were like the bar guest, and yeah. I think. They they were like descendants of the people who like the original Talan people, and then yeah. the Talan, and then there's like another group of people that were like the seafaring people, but those were like also technically the Bargas, but like a different group, which right, is what right. I thought when they first showed up. But then they were like doing their, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Burns yeah. At, uh, yeah. impressions at Carsa, and then I was like, <laughs> oh, this is the Seven Faces in the Rock, right. Okay, I think you're probably right, as you almost always are. Um, <laughs> all right, so the the next scene is uh, Karza and uh, Torvald get back into their dinghy and row toward this wall. And uh, what do you know? Silgar, Damisk, and Barag are there. Like, hey, guys, total uh, misunderstanding. Uh, uh, we're could you help us? Like the the little debris island we're on is kind of uh, floating away we're gonna definitely die here if you don't help we got a sweet boat that you got there but you're also gonna die if we don't help (laughs) and am i very good at almost anything no (laughs) but can i see a hole (laughs) yes but i'm only gonna point at it until when we get in the boat yeah give me let me in the boat and i'll guide you toward the portal out of here. Uh, I loved the the moment of going through the portal and it's like closing and it slices off the bottom of the boat Ooh. and evidently Borog's legs uh, as well, although we don't realize that until later. Is it so like that good. it's closing and so it closes on the back half of the boat? My brain kept being like, wouldn't everybody's legs be chopped off? Was everybody <laughs> else riding like knees up to their shoulders? Through the uh, portal. That's interesting. Maybe it is just the back. I thought I my mental. I pictured image was it the, shearing the off the whole bottom. <laughs> yeah. I pictured it shearing the whole bottom, but then I'm like, it must have been at an angle to just get one of their legs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but amazing moment where Carsa's like, I gotta t- I gotta bring this guy. Oh, no legs. Eh, I still gotta bring this guy. <laughs> um, and they're swimming through a really cool moment where he's like, What's this giant gray catfish that really wants to <laughs> yeah. eat us? I'll, I've seen catfish, and now this this one is weird and gray and seal skinned, and it's that's <laughs> odd. And they're like, you, "That's a shark, bro. That's a shark." <laughs> that I was just, a fun realization. It's fun, and him being a catfish were worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that moment where he, you know, completely murders the the shark, and then reaches in and pulls out Barug's body and brings it up. He's like. <laughs> I got our friend. And they're like, we don't need him anymore. He's, <laughs> He's like, that's for your call to make. I did my part. <laughs> you told me watch him. I did it. Here he is. <laughs> so good. Uh, and even like before they get onto the beach and he, you know, slops that body up there. Man, Silgar, just him being like, everybody's like trying to share. They, some people just have an, oh, an yeah. or he has this barrel and then, Damask is like, hey boss, give me a give me a section. And he like splashes away from him. He's like, this is the precious water. <laughs> yeah. It will sink with even one more person. And Carson's like, e- literally everybody could have floated on that one. But okay, man. <laughs> yeah, you so do good. you. We got the ore. Yeah, he's so uh well uh uh well realized as a as a meanie, as a baddie. Um, <laughs> very fun. And um so, th- but he does transport them a couple of times through a warren uh, to a city, uh, to a town, and uh, they go their separate ways. Um, and uh, right, this is, is oh, that- it's uh, Ur- Erlatan, right? They, they get they they show up in Erlatan, or they're going to walk to Erlatan. That's what it is. They have to walk. It's a fifteen day walk to Erlatan. Yeah, oh, no, no, they- no, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry, I'm completely messing this up. Um, they, this is when they find, uh, they get to the big, uh, tower and they find that they saw from the water and then they all get to the beach and they are like, leave us alone. We're done here. Our contract's over. Get out of here. Right. And then Torvald and Carsa go explore the light, which ends up being a tower made of fossils. 
<laughs> which Carson's like, that's not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And they meet the keeper. The keeper, really interesting character. I'm curious if this was a one off or we'll ever see the keeper again. But the keeper seems like, seems rad. And I love that he's like, making the uh natural history museum in his house <laughs> yeah you know he, uh, he's got this uh giant uh skeleton that he's that he's putting together and he's like i found the forearms first and they were tiny and i'm like he found a tyrannosaurus rex is that what he <laughs> yeah. found yeah and he's got like the skull there uh uh isn't like as they walk up and they're like walking towards the space there's like a fork in the path and like there's a bit there's a big old skull there and you seem <laughs> yeah. to be one tiny dude so and he's like that's fine i found it pretty cool let's look at the rest of the body uh yeah very cool very cool um and you know this dude is is huge and uh tough and punches carsa in the gut and breaks his ribs knocking him out again. Um, and uh, we realize that he, you know, he's not to be messed with. He faked his own death, stole, stole half the treasure of uh, Aaron and uh, went off to be uh, a bone collector, I guess. <laughs> the, the, bo the bone guy. Yeah. Uh, I love how chill he is. And then he, you know, annihilates Carson's whole rib cage. And he's like, ah, I'm sorry, I just... I get angry sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I got anyway, a help Sorry. me with this wall. Uh, <laughs> the roof. Yeah, it's the roof. Like they the like knock yeah. the roof off. They need to remove the roof because the skeleton's getting too big and he needs to <laughs> build the house higher. Such a great scene. Uh -huh. I love it. Um, uh, anyway, so he feeds them and uh, then they're like, well, okay, later. Got to walk to Erlatan, which again, 15 day walk away. Um, and but before they go, he gives them, you know, he's basically giving them the, the care package to kick them out on the street, but also throws them a bundle of cash money. Yeah. And reveals that before he died, he like emptied out a city's treasury yeah. for his untimely death. They pretended um, to drown. Yeah. And yeah. he's like, and you could try and kill me to get the rest of it, but that you'll never, you never will. So just don't just take it. Don't yeah. tell anybody we ever spoke and get out of here. Yeah. And I just loved that. Cause yeah, just, you just know, once you get to a city, they're going to be like this guy. Uh, is, wait, 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 wait. No, we already met that guy. Never mind. Never mind. I was like, did we, did we meet somebody who drowned, but didn't actually drown? But he was the captain of that boat that we already met. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so then we, uh, we're we walking along village after village after village, get to the sixth village, and the bunch of uh, Arak tribal horsemen show up. And they're like, we, we're, we're capturing you yet again. And Carlos is like, sigh. Okay, I'm not going to fight back this time. <laughs> Just do it. I'm bored. This is ridiculous. Chris is like uh, sigh and Silgar's like, we've got him. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Him again. I'm like, come on, get this guy out of here. It's so funny. He's like, help us, help us. Oh, you helped us? <laughs> I've got you now. <laughs> it's so funny. So like Batman villain, you know? Um, and uh, they put, the, th this is a horrible thing for me. For some reason, this triggered me. The putting the chains on so tight Ugh. that- your hands and feet turn black and you you can't feel them anymore. Oh, there's something so disturbing about that to me. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, it's like one of, that's a, a nightmare situation. Yeah. Did not like. Especially like how long it's happening for. I'm like, you ever put an elastic band on your finger for like Oof. one minute? No, 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 no. <laughs> It creeps me out. It gives me the heebie-jeebies. Do not like. <laughs> Do not like. Um, and anyway, they're uh, they're stuck in this room. Uh, and, uh, Torvald has a brilliant escape plan as we've seen numerous times. These guys come up with brilliant escape plans. Uh, he takes off their clothes and fills them with, uh, with straw or hay or something yeah. and then puts them in these smokeless fireplaces, creating tons of smoke. And they're like, Oh no, everybody knows we're here. <laughs> Run. The Grawl are, are here. I don't remember the Grawl. I know oh, we've seen grawl? that. That yes. name before. So the Grawl in the desert, I believe it's Kalam. Yeah. Or is present pretending to be a Grawl. Right. Uh, and they're like, you know, pretending to be a Grawl is like a crime against the Grawl. 
And then he's like, oh, by the way, there's the girl. And he's like, oh, well, uh, gotta go. And he kind of has to peace out. And they're like, notoriously. But then I think he, he still like fakes it till he makes it into their company. Uh, I can't remember like the specifics of that interaction, but I'm pretty sure he's like, oh yeah, I was, oh, he says that he was outcast, but that's also, no matter which Grawl tribe you were outcast from, it's a crime against the Grawl, whatever. But we know that yeah, the yeah. Grawl are like, again, super powerful warriors. Um, right. And They take no prisoners. They slaughter yeah. everybody. They're coming for you. Yeah. So all of these Iraq are freaking out because the Grawl knows where they are because the smoke signal uh, by the way, we're in chapter four now, I should mention. This is how yes. chapter four starts. And um, I was, I know I should know better at this point, but <clears throat> when Torvald Nam's throat got slit, I was like, oh, oh no. I love that guy. Love that guy. <laughs> it felt like um, um, Bay, uh, Bay, what's his name? Bayroth. Found out how, Bayroth, thank you. It felt like Bayroth dying. It felt like, mm -hmm. like all oh, these people that have been teaching Karsa not to be such a, a jerk are, mm -hmm. are dying off. And I, I really bought the death. I bought it. Even though he sees him twitch at the end, I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I uh, I feel like the, the fact that it specifically said he was like distracted and he sort of like slid it as he was turning mm. to get got by the growl. I, I had hope. And it was like, like deeply unceremonious and we've had like some unceremonious yeah. things, but there's a, a, a lack of finality to how quickly he was like out and then chasing, like falling through Warrens with Silgar, like after that moment in the escape to leave. And it was almost like the name got dropped too quickly from the, the POV. And maybe that was just like, part of me was like, maybe this is just how Karsa is, but he's, I felt like there was even this much more mourning for Bayroth and Delam Thord. Mm. And I thought the Bayroth. I thought the Bayroth death was was pretty abrupt and jarring, and this felt similar to me. And I was like, "Oh, this is going to be a theme." But then he does see him move at the end. I was like, "Oh, maybe." But but he, you know, he's convinced he's dead, and so I was I was kind of buying it. And I was really mourning the loss of a character that I had fallen in love with. Yeah. Um, uh, so then Karsa um, wakes up with Malazans again. Uh, a healer is inspecting him, and evidently his face has been heavily tattooed. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're like, oh, his face is so messed up. I'm like, oh, yeah, because they were like hitting him. Yeah. And then it was like, no, because they tattooed it to look like they're like, okay, you didn't, we went to jail because you didn't look enough like an escaped prisoner. Well, guess what? Now you do, sweetie. Yeah. And yeah, I, I sort like, of skipped over the part where. Uh, Silgar, you know, they, they go through the war Warrens, they uh, land in Erlatan. The Malazans are like, hey, what are you doing with that? He's an escaped prisoner. No, no, no. Prisoners have face tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> Got me. Uh, yeah. So then they actually do face tattoo him. Mm -hmm. And they're like, did you have to do so much face tattooing? <laughs> it's very really, funny. It's been hours. I mean. It's, it's excessive. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of. We, we we got it, and now it's just now it's it's too much. I wonder if it's gonna hold, because that's the one thing that they're saying. They like tattooed him or whatever, and they like beat the crap out of him. And the healer's like, I ain't never seen healing like that. I've never right. seen somebody being able to deal with what's happening. Like, look at it; he's already better. Yeah. And then they kind of shuffle that guy out, and the next scene starts. But that made me be like, maybe it's just gonna push the ink out. Maybe he just won't look that well, way forever. Not to jump ahead, but when we met him already, did he have face tattoos? I think he did. I don't think he? that he did. No, I don't remember. Um, I got to go back and read that that all that stuff from from Dead House Gates again. I'm like, no, we'll get to that. But anyway, <laughs> um, so I love that these the, the Malazans. We meet these new Malazans, uh, Scrawl, the uh, the tattoo <laughs> tattoo artist, and uh, Jib and Gullstream, <laughs> which. I, I'm sure you caught it as well, but I just was so tickled by the name Gullstream because this character has white blotches on their forehead. <laughs> and so it's literally like a Gullstream is like the poop that comes out of a gull. The, it's, they named him after p gull bird, poop. Bird, bird, bird poo. It yeah. tickled me. I don't know. I found that very funny. <laughs> I mean, if, you know, you got you to gotta lean in sometimes. What is, 
What, what's my nickname, everybody? Oh, Scrawl, because you do all those tattoos. Rad, 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 rad. What's my nickname, everybody? How about uh, uh, bird poop? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's me. Um, okay. You can either have Gulfstream or you can have Goosey Poopers. <laughs> Goosey those are the two, two options. I uh, I love uh, that Carsa is back. It's just funny how often he's prisoner, how often he's knocked unconscious, how often he's chained. It's just like, it's very funny. And now he meets up with this blue-eyed prisoner, a native uh, who, uh, you know, through the whole thing, I'm like, who's this going to be? Who's this going to be? Who's this going to be? Who's it going to turn out to be? And we I don't know we about you. We didn't find out. I, have, I had no clue the reveal – that we're about to get. I had, I did not see it coming whatsoever. Did you? I did not see it coming. And I cannot tell you how delightful it was because uh, yeah, I was finishing the reading of the chapters uh, yesterday and Jeff, my husband, Jeff is uh, a little bit behind. He's in chapter two or just starting chapter three. And he was talking about it. Well, I'll wait, you say what the reveal is and then I'll tell you how. Uh, well, yeah. So, so uh, <laughs> we have to break out again. So, uh, the um, this uh, they're headed to the Otacharol mines. They're going to be sold off, uh, you know, as as slaves into the into the mines. Uh, Carsa at this point has just accepted that's going to happen. He's like, I guess, mm-hmm. I guess I'm destined to be an Otacharol miner. Um, and we he t- talks to this prisoner, and there's this moment where the prisoner's like. He's like, yeah, we, all us Teblor are that way. And he's like, Teblor? Oh, sick. And I was like, what, what, what? And then they what's get distracted. Funny? What's funny? Yeah, what's funny? They get distracted by the prison break that's about to happen. And I was like, no, 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 no. Get back to that topic. I want to well, know. Also, that topic was so interesting. Uh, that, that conversation, I think when he said, like, I am Teblor, he's like, that's what you call yourselves? Oh, my God. But yeah. in that moment, he said something about, like, I think it's Carson going, what is this Otatoro, by the way, that he's yes. going to? Everybody is so worried about it. So good. And he's like, well, it's this mine. It's usually like a dust. Blah, blah, blah. And he goes, I think I've seen that dust before. Like, we got yeah. dust like that. We like harvest it. We make our blood armor out of it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. He's coating his body. He's eating Otatoro. He's like, he yeah. is at least 5% Otatoro at this point. And, and that's like, why all the magic doesn't, doesn't work, work on, him. on him. Oh my god. That's why gosh. he's awesome. So yeah. cool. And that just, of course, made me be like, well, everybody who's been down in the, the mines, everybody's like, it's so bad for you. You're gonna die if you have it. And maybe it's because he's like really strong as a warrior. Or maybe all these people that are like in these mines who are driven, oh, well, it t- talks about them getting driven mad by it. Yeah. Which, you know, we've well, the, already the seen mages, somebody get driven mad by yeah, it. Yeah, the mages all definitely get driven mad by it, right? Because it, it cuts off users. their connection to the to the Warrens. So it that drives them nuts. Yeah. Uh, we know that. Yeah. But I think, yeah, I think there's Are they a, secretly building a little army of super people who are mage resistant? Dude, I don't know. Because we know that several people have had that happen already. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very, very cool. Very cool. And I love how it all is explained. The blood sword and all that stuff. It's red. Blood is red. But they call it blood. But it's it's red. We knew that it's like it was all there. It's it was so all there. Cool. And it's so good. Yeah. Um, but yes, then we have this. Uh, the prison break that comes in. Hood is back. Uh, who are you? Someone who loves you. Um, to quote <laughs> Return of the Jedi. Um <laughs> <laughs> the uh, it's it was it's Torvald yeah, he Woo! survived and he uh, he's like oh yeah house house nom 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 is uh, <laughs> is uh, liaisons between yeah we're the cool growl. we're we're, yeah. we're cool with the with the grawl we rock we rock with the grawl we're gonna sell them slaves <laughs> we're awesome um, and uh, they break out uh, they have a tearful goodbye. Well, they're like, you know, what are we going to do about all these other people that chained up? Like, oh, no, they are already dead. <laughs> they're I, all dead. I negotiated for uh, you, you, and then you are from a negotiation with this guy, so he gets saved too. You're welcome. But yeah. everybody else. What are we going to do with all the other people? Pres- they had crimes, so <laughs> the girl killed them. They're criminals. What are we going to do with all those people that are sleeping? They're not sleeping. Oh, sweet. They're not sleeping. Oh, they're not oh. sleeping. But they're all so pe- – oh, oh, 
That's so good. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, then we have this great escape with, uh, Karsa and the blue eyed stranger, uh, fleeing, um, uh, being chased. Uh, the horsemen are on their, on their heels. They're, they're trying to, you know, stay hidden. And, and, uh, Karsa's like, I just will wait until night and murder all of them. And the guy's like, why don't we wait till night and get farther away from him? He's like, nah, I prefer murder. I prefer the murder. <laughs> And he's um, like, there's like 17 of them. And he's like, exactly. That's my number. That's my sweet spot. <laughs> That's why I really shine. Um, the, uh, the, they get to, they get into this, uh, this, this tower. They go down stairs, deep, 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 meet somebody named Mebra. And I'm like, I remember Mebra. Mm-hmm. Mebra that, was, uh, the was, person who gave Kalam the book. So that's right. The the book of the Drijna, Drijna, um, and set Kalam off on this quest to meet up with um, what's her name, Shaik. Shaik. And we know that Mebra. We know from book two that Mebra was a traitor mm-hmm. and was just sending Kalam with the book as a way to find. Shaik and murder Shaik, which totally works because Shaik does get murdered. Mm-hmm. But it's cool because they, Karsa and the Blue Eyed Stranger, also re- figure out that Mebro is a traitor in their own way because as they leave, they're tailed and they're like, oh, he must have told somebody. So I thought yeah. that was cool, like two different ways to come to the same conclusion. Yes, I and I liked that very much. I I like the whole. Again, I, anytime somebody's like teaching something, somebody else something in the book, it's interesting whether they're like dropping knowledge or they're actually like showing a little what like thing about how they've experienced the world. And you know, this this blue eyed stranger being like uh, horses. And Carson's like, I don't know horses, and he's like, feel the ground. Yeah, I loved I loved this, and then what that means. Eh, it's just great. There's these little connections and these little glimpses into like the broader world that this person's from and then it shuts and you're on your way again and you're just two people yeah. journeying. I had a moment when we're, we meet Mebra where I was like, okay, I know who this is. I should be able to put together who the blue eyed stranger is. I should have enough information now, <laughs> but I was like, I still don't know. I still didn't. I, like, I still yeah. didn't. Yeah. Ooh. So good. Uh, okay. So um, they come upon a 50 or Carson's like, okay, I'm going to murder everybody at night. And Blue Eyed Stranger's like, you, I'm not participating in that. <laughs> I'm going to run. And they're like, okay, all right, right. Peace out then. Fine. Well, I guess we're done. Our, See you later, maybe. Ways. Yeah. Uh, so um, Carsa goes in and fi- uh, goes into the camp, finds the 15 armored horsemen and proceeds to murder all of them. Um, he realizes that they're going to have to change out their crossbow cords. I thought that was such a cool detail of like, mm-hmm. I've been watching those crossbow men. And I know if you have your crossbow uh, loaded the whole time, you got to switch out the cord. So I'm going to wait till they do that. And then I'm going to murder everyone. Mm-hmm. So rad. Um, he goes in, he's slicing, dicing uh, all, the, uh, all the things that Carsa does best. <laughs> and uh, finds Silgar, who tries to attack him with sorcery, and Cars is like, "Oh yeah, this is I'm the time where Silgar boy. again." I'm like, "How does this guy <laughs> make allies? This person who is trash so yeah. easily, not only navigating the world, but getting like 15 to 20 people to help him do it is infuriating to me. Like that guy's such a piece of junk." <laughs> I know, but he gets his right then because yep. Cars is like. I'm going to cut off your hands and feet and legs and arms and slice you up. <laughs> and he's just like chopping pieces off of him. And the blue eyed stranger's like, that's, uh, are you just going to murder him? Or are you going to, uh, he's like, no, 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 no. He doesn't deserve he, a quick death. He does not deserve, he does not deserve a warrior's death. He does not deserve a quick death. I, the, such a chilling line where he's like, oh, I'm going to kill him, but I'm going to drive him insane first. Ugh. And then tourniqueting the limbs. Well, he, like he's like, well, he's bleeding. Dark... You can't bring him along with us. They're going to follow the trail of blood and know exactly where we're going. He's like, all right, I'll 
prevent him from leaving a trail of blood. But I'm definitely bringing him and definitely making Not sure he wakes him up. Not yet. Yes. 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 Uh, so, so, so good. And then we end the chapter. We end the book. We end, I believe, our time in POV of Carsa mm-hmm. with the grand reveal that the blue-eyed stranger is, in fact, Leo Man, and that Carsa, though they call themselves Teblor, are really is really a member of the Thelomen Toblakai, and that he was Toblakai, the guy we refer to all constantly as Toblakai in book two, Toblakai yes. and Leo Man. Ugh, that that juicy reveal is so good because I was sitting on the book probably one page away from this reveal and Jeff kept talking to me and I was like, I got four, I got four, it says four minutes. It says three minutes left in the book. Please stop talking to me. And he's like, well, what do you think this guy, like Carson, blah, blah, blah. Don't you remember there's a guy with the blood sword? And I'm like, yes, Jeff Kanata and I had this conversation. It's not Teblor. It's something else with a T, but it's definitely not that. And then I was like, <laughs> and next page. Hey! <laughs> it was yeah. like so exciting. And of course, I'm not like saying that to him because he's not there yet. But I was like, okay, no, he, yeah, no, same guy. Okay, we got there. We all got there. We all got there. And, you know, I was sort of proud of us last week that we did, you know, skirt around the edges of it. But mm-hmm. I also didn't feel like that got me any closer to I I'm guessing this moment yes, at all yes. is so delicious. I don't know how that's possible. Where I'm literally like, maybe, do you remember there was a guy who had a wooden <laughs> sword that was, eh. All right. Oh, it's that guy! I don't remember that guy. I remember him being described as like a like a big boy, but I did not when I read that chapter in um, Dead House Gates be like, oh, he's a giant man. Yeah, I did. Oh, not I remember him together. being enormous, and but you not remember he as goes off and he Carson kills. Feels. Well, don't, don't you remember he goes off at one point? And they're like, there's a bear, or maybe is it? A, I think it's a bear, and he's like, he goes off and murders it and brings it back, and they're like, nobody can kill that thing, and he. He brings it back and he ha- has it. He-, he killed it. But I-, mm-hmm. I totally want to go back and reread all of that stuff with Leo Men and-, and the Toblakai because obviously I know that person now. I've been inside their head and I want to recontextualize all of those interactions. Well, here's the other reason that I wasn't convinced that it was the same guy either. And especially like through these chapters is – him being like, I'm not kneeling to anybody. I'm not serving anybody. And my remembrance of that scene is that he is distinctly serving Shaikh. I agree. So and there's then, clearly a gap of time between when we drop off now and where we see them again in Dead House Gates, where so, he finds his happening. faith. Something, yeah. Because that, that was the other thing that kind of didn't line up for me. I was like, oh, man, I want to go back and reread all that stuff. But my understanding of the relationship between Toblakai and Leoman was that they were super tight. And I would kind of buy, I, knowing what I know, I feel like that relationship, my memory of that relationship was much closer to the relationship between Karsa and Torvald mm-hmm. than Karza and Leoman. So it, it's interesting to me. I feel like if, if, if the building of the ties that we got between Karsa and um, and uh, and Torvald w- was resulted in the relationship with Leoman and and uh, Tobakai, it would make more sense to me. I would it would line more up. But so clearly, there's a a gap of some kind of kinship between those two as well. My memory of those too, is that they didn't feel super tight, but they felt like they definitely felt like they were working together because that they are like never reveal his name. They're just like, that's not, his name is not Teblor, but that is what he is. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, or not Teblor, Toblakai. His name's Toblakai. not Toblakai, but that yeah. is what he is. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's there's like re- a weird distance because he's not like, you know, Kars, you know, there's not like a closeness yeah. that I felt there. It just felt united. But also in that moment where we're like, you've got these two guys out there, big boys, Leoman and this Toblakai out there to protect Shaikh. And then Shaikh's like, Ding! and like just and instantly yeah. annihilated. Now I'm like, how calculated. Does, like, did Shaikh know that that was going to happen? Did they know that was going to happen? If they're like these, if like looking back at that scene through the lens of 
who Karsa is. Did he know that those guys were there? And they're like, yeah, now's the time. She's going to die. And then we're going to go get those dudes or whatever it is. It's like, how much of that is known? I'm so eager to see this scene from another perspective. I don't know if we will in this book, but I certainly am hungry for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was I was tempted to go back and reread that before we recorded, but I kind of didn't want to. I kind of wanted to let that recontextualization recontextualization happen, uh, sort of you know disproportionately. <laughs> when we're done book ten and we loop back to the beginning, it's going to be so satisfying. Yeah, <laughs> when we do when we do this entire series again. <laughs> um, the other thing that I recall, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I remember when Shaik died. One of them, and I thought it was, I think it's the Toblakai. One of them goes and like meditates for days. I don't know if it was Leoman or the Toblakai. But one of them just kind of, and I wonder if there's some sort of communing with Urugal or something like what is happening there. And it, yeah, I, I really want to understand now what Karsa wants out of all of this because it feels like he, decides he's going to protect Shaikh, right? That's the, they're the Shaikh bodyguards. Guardians, right? yeah. Yeah. So, it's so interesting. It's so cool to completely understand, go back and spend four chapters understanding a character that we were hung out with for very small amounts of time, but I don't know. I I, I just thought that was rad. Yeah. Ugh. And I will reiterate something that has been vehemently disagreed with in the in our comments i really do think these for these four chapters stand as such a cool uh self-contained like get you hooked on the sh on the series kind of thing and mm -hmm. i know everybody disagrees with me and maybe us but <laughs> um i just thought that the adventure of it all the clarity uh the 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 focus on one group of people and the just the ride through all of that is so gripping and so uh, infectious that I think if I had been introduced to it that way, I would have been salivating to read more. But I I loved Gardens of the Moon from the from the word go anyway. So who knows? But I, I do think these four chapters just are such a fun fun ride. Yeah, I agree with that. I uh. End of sentence. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Speaking of sentences. We well, before to... we get to sentences, oh. actually, okay. this is like a bit of a, de a departure, but I don't know if it's better at the end or here, but I'm already talking. Um, uh, thinking of the dinosaur skull that uh, uh -huh. What's-His-Face, the Keeper, was collecting. Yeah. This is not quite the same thing, but it did remind me that last week I got a gift from a friend of mine. I put together something at work. And uh, this person was in charge of making little uh, goodie bags for everybody. But he made me a special one and it came with this little patch in it. I don't know if I can get this to read. Oh, that's <laughs> so rad. That's so rad. The sword arms. It's so amazing. It's a, it's a Jurassic Park logo, but the Tyrannosaurus Rex has sword arms and it says Kel Hunter. Very cute. I thought you would enjoy this. Uh, Can we know. somehow mass produce those and sell them <laughs> that would be awesome can, can these be our idea now <laughs> <laughs> so uh, cool but so 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 cute what uh, a clever thing would this person that gifted you that is that are they a fan of the melanson books they are they actually watch every episode hi tyler um, thank you <laughs> well done tyler very good job very tyler cool. So rad. Uh, anyway, we can do favorite sentences now. All right, but. let's do it. I, I suspect you and I might have some overlap on our favorite sentences this week because there were some, I, I felt, real clear standouts. Um, I, I great, have great a, stuff. Yeah, I have uh, three in my brain. I, I felt like I highlighted a bunch more, but my Kindle out was acting a little funny. So I feel like maybe I fat fingered something and I lost a couple of my shorter ones. But I have a couple. Yeah. One of them I think you you don't have. Uh, and I'll start with that one. It is Great. a bit longer, okay. not that long, <laughs> but it did make me laugh. <laughs> Let me say, <laughs> this is the Torvald talking with uh, one of the Malazan guards about whether or not he's a claw. <laughs> Shard stared down at Torvald Nam. Why am I talking to you, thief? You might damn well be one of her spies, a claw for all I know. If I am corporal, you haven't been treating me very well. 
a detail I'd be sure to put in my report. This secret one, the one I'm secretly writing, that is. Shard, wasn't it? As in piece of broken glass, yes? And you called the Empress bitch, was it? <laughs> <laughs> so good. My uh, secret, the, the secret one, and I'm secretly writing secretly. It's, and, uh, uh, just, to, just taking notes here. What exactly did you say about the Empress again? <laughs> uh, be explicit. <laughs> so good. So good. Uh, I love this one. Uh, this is um, Karsa. Uh, Karsa's talking to um, a Torvald, and Torvald says, um, how many of us bow before a god in the desperate hope that we can somehow shape our fate? Praying to that familiar face pushes away our terror of the unknown, the unknown being the future. Who knows? Maybe these Tistiandi are the only ones among us are the only ones among us all who see the truth, the truth being oblivion. Mm. Good one. Yeah. We're just trying to we cling on to something familiar because we're terrified of the unknown. So good. So, so good. The next one I have, uh, I think might be one that we both have, but this yeah. is Karsa thinking about his experience with Torvald Nam and uh, his relationship with subtlety. Torvald Nam's endless words, but no, more than just that. All that Karsa had experienced since leaving his village had served as instruction on the complexity of the world. Subtlety had been a venomed serpent slithering unseen through his life. Its fangs had sunk deep many times, yet not once had he become aware of their origin. Not once had he even understood the source of the pain. The poison itself had coursed deep within him, and the only answer he gave, when he gave one at all, was of violence, often misdirected, a lashing out on all sides. That's self-reflection. Yeah. Progress, uh, understanding, character development. I love he's, it. He's learning. <laughs> he's learning. He's becoming a better person. So all that time we spent in his uh, despicable thoughts, we see, oh, he actually is capable of growth. Yeah. I love that. Um, I love this one so very much. Um, there, I mean, this is another example of Torvald like laying the truth down uh, and Karsa learning. Um, the Deru grinned. You're learning, friend. The lessons of civilization. Just so. There's little value in seeking to find reasons for why people do what they do or feel the way they feel. Hatred is a most pernicious weed, finding root in any kind of soil. It feeds on itself with words. Indeed with words. Form an opinion, say it often enough, and pretty soon everyone's saying it right back at you. And then it becomes a conviction, fed by unreasoning anger and defended with weapons of fear. At which point, words become useless and you're left with a fight to the death. Uh, that, that's I, insight. I, I agree. It. I love that one. That was my my final quote that I was going to pull as well. But I also, that is where I would end it as well. But I also love how it continues, uh, mm. just the next two sentences with Karsa Grunts. A fight beyond death, I would say. True enough, generation after generation. Mm. So yeah. this, ha this hatred that becomes conviction is not just a personal thing that you feel, but it's something you can pass on, something that can grow, become exponential over time, and whole generations of people can suffer from a small single seed of hatred. Yeah. Uh, so true and yeah. so terrible. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I'll do w one more quick one um, just because I love this uh, realization, this, this continued growth that Kars is having. Uh, he says, uh, "With you and your, uh, without you and your endless words, Torvald Nam, the madness I had feigned would have become a madness in truth. I had followers, but not allies, and only now do I understand the difference, and it is vast. And from this, I have come to understand what it is to po to possess regrets, Bayroth Guild, Delam Thord, even the Rathid, whom I have greatly weakened." When I return to my old path, back into the lands of the Teblor, there are wounds that I shall need to mend. And so, 
When you say it is time to return to your family, Torvald Nam, I understand, and my heart is gladdened. That's not the Karsa we first meet, right? Not he has at changed. All. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that I'm that is one of the quotes that I'm like, I could have sworn I had more. That was one of the <laughs> ones that was sitting in my brain. So it's glad that you highlighted that. First time he he realizes what regret is, right? He's been so sure of himself. And Bay, Bayroth got what he wished for, which is a lack of certainty, right? Uh, Karsa gets to that place that Bayroth wished for him, which is don't be so certain of yourself all the time. He uh, has regret now. You know? I also love that 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 moment. You know, he's like, Torvald, I don't know how to say this, buddy, poetry. Like, he's like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I just want to take a quick second here to tell you something very profound. You've changed my life <laughs> yeah. in, in measurable ways. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> something summed up in the most perfect possible way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so great. Uh, uh, all right, folks. Uh, next week, I believe we're two more chapters. I, I didn't believe check. so. And we're in to a new sub book which is, I believe, called Cold Iron. Exciting. So be with us then. We'll see you. Uh, again, uh, we love your comments, your questions. If you have a topic for our non-spoiler section, we welcome that as well. Please send it to us. You can reach us at dlcfeedback at gmail.com or right here on the YouTube uh, post. You can comment there or in our Discord, which is a really fun place to be. Lots of great folks hanging out, talking about the books. Uh, you can find that at DLC, excuse me, 5 by 5 DLC on Discord. Uh, and then the book club sub threads. All right. Have a great week. Uh, we'll see you next time. Guess we only have one thing left to do. Dance. When the world's too dark. But you're doing it with your